If I can have everybody's attention here in the media center, we are now joined by Brendan Gaunt, driver of the number 62 Wix Filter Chevrolet in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. The Wix D2. Wix yeah, D2. There you go. Wix D2 this week. You've got a lot of excitement surrounding that car coming into Texas. Talk about your love of this place and what you've got, uh, what you've got going this weekend. You know, Texas has always been so great to me. I mean, everybody right knows of it, and we've been talking about it for years. This place was, was so great to me early in my career, and it's been pretty good lately. Um, last year, this race, it was the Wix Filters, the Wix D2 car also. And we, uh, man, we were running like third or fourth, and, and God, Kale Conley, you know, poor kid, just Murphy's Law for me. He blew a tire one second earlier, I'm good. One second later, I'm good. But he, uh, he you know, just Murphy's Law caught me. So we were really fast, felt really good. Came back in the spring, we're also good. Um, so this this new uh, new setups that we have to run, we feel pretty confident that we we are on the right page for them. Um, all the RCR Chevy's been pretty fast, you know, on and off the first first part of the year. And coming off a two week break, you know, give the engineers some time. Sometimes you give the engineers too much time, they can crunch too much data. And but uh, I feel like they've done a pretty good job this week. And Shane feels really excited. And and getting Shane excited some days is difficult. So. <laughs> Having Shane excited this week made, makes me pretty happy. So he, he feels pretty good, and we're going to go see if we can't uh, you know, figure out how to keep, keep going around this place. How excited are you for next week when we go to Bristol, the new uh, Xfinity Dash for Cash? No. The heat race is the main. Uh, it's definitely going to be interesting for everybody because this isn't one that anybody's, you know, a lot of us been in this sport a long time, and, you know, remember single car, single file restarts with lap towners on the inside, and, you know, remember, you know, racing to cautions and all these different rules. This is one that nobody's, nobody in this series, in this sport has ever done. You know, yeah, there's, there's late model races and stuff like that with, da you know, dash races, but not this format, this style. Um, really looking forward to getting there and, and seeing how this book writes out. You know, everybody, everybody wants to either write good or bad about it, and, and you can't, uh, my opinion is you can't write good or bad until you see how the first page looks. Yeah. So uh, we get there next week, see how that works out. It, I, hopefully we're one of the four cars that qualifies for the dash, which would be a, a nice, nice, you know, bonus for us. But uh, in the end, it's Bristol. Want to go win at Bristol? That's that's a place that I've come very close a couple times, and one of the better tracks in my career. So I, I want to go there and try to uh, get a W, and and you know maybe call it two in a row if we've come out of Texas with one. Outstanding. Let's open the floor to questions. We'll start up here with Bob and work our way around. Bob Parker, CSPN. Never heard of him. Oh, hi, Bob. <laughs> hey. Um, <laughs> do, do you expect, it's, it's my understanding that if you wreck in the heat race, you can't bring out a backup. So how do you approach that heat race next week? It, it, it's just like a race to me, Bob. Everybody's asking a lot of questions that we kind of don't know the answers to. But what they've said is you can work on your car during your heat race. And once the red, you know, once the checker flag, if you're in heat one, then you have to stop and wait till the main event starts to you know, like like we always try to repair a race car so I'm just going to take it we're approaching it the same way if you wreck on lap five you go to the garage you don't get to pull it back up out you work on it and if you can get it back out you get back out same sort of thing it doesn't really change I think from our standpoint other than the fact that there's a whole race that you're going to be sitting there looking at your race car and can't do anything but it might give you time you know you're going to be a bunch of laps down but you will look at you can look at that and say okay you have to rebuild something that normally you don't have the time to rebuild. Well, they can't. They, we can't touch the race car, but we can work in the trailer to build a part to put back on the race car. You know, so I, I think there's definitely some differences that will be in that race for, from that rule. But in the end, if you wreck on lap five, Bob, what's the difference? You know, you, you wreck out in an early restart. You wreck out. You know, you go to the garage. You either repair it or you load it up. Well, same thing there. It's still the race. Even though it's a heat race, it's still the race. So it's, you know, I, I think that's probably the right move to do. I don't believe you should be allowed to pull a backup car out because you wrecked in the heat race. It's still part of the Bristol race. So that's, we'll see. I mean, I may change my, if I wreck in, in the first heat race on lap three and <laughs> I want to pull a backup car out, I'll come and argue the other way. We'll head to the back. <clears throat> Janine Cloud, Skirts and Scuffs. So um, with all three of the RCR Cup cars finishing in the top ten last week, what was the mood like back at the shop this week? I would love to answer that for you, but I live most of the time in Las Vegas now, so I have not been in the race shop. Um, I do know that it was a very good day for the team. A.J. Allmendinger finished in second, which is one of our satellite teams, 
and all three of the RCR Chevys finish in the top ten. Great run by Austin, great run by Paul, great qualifying and run by Ryan Newman. So I know that uh, talking to the boys, everybody's been pretty pumped up. And that trickles over to the Xfinity side. You know, when, when those guys are running good, everybody's happy. You know, and when everybody's happy, the, even our shops are happy. So it's a, uh, I know everybody's in a pretty good mood, but that just because you had three top tens, four top tens in your teams, doesn't mean that you sit there and say, yay, we've got it. They're digging hard, they're still working. And we're coming here with, we actually have a couple new pieces I know of 100% sure on our Xfinity Chevrolets that uh, we, we feel are going to be better from what we had at California. So the guys are still working, and it's great. They got three top tens. That was last week. Now it's time to go to this week, and everybody smile about it, but got to back it up again. Go next to Don. Dominic, got to go on the racingexperts.com. So five races in, sixth in points. How closely are you monitoring points at this point in the season? Well, with the new chase format, you don't have to monitor points that closely. You know, and that's what, what's great about the, the chase for, you know, format in the Xfinity series is that we don't have to sit there and say, man, we're already 34 points out of the lead. You know, that's seven races, eight races to make up. Um, all we got to do is make sure we maintain that top 12 position, which I feel pretty confident we can do. And it, it, we also are going to sit there and try to say we're going to lock ourselves in and get the W. You know, that's our main goal is to get locked in with that W, and then we don't have to worry about points until we go to Kentucky? Anyone? Bueller? Yes? Kentucky. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so, you know, I'd love to be able to not have to worry about points one more race until Kentucky. We just got to go out there and, and try to get one of those wins and, and keep working hard. And then once you get that, that's what always made, in my opinion, made Jimmy Johnson and Chad Canals so great. Once they knew that they were really set in points, they would try a million things to, to, you know, see what they could do to be faster. And then when, the, you know, people, how many years of those six championship year runs did, did everybody say, oh, look, they're not running good in August. They're not running good in early September. Well, yeah, they didn't have to. You know, they were trying to experiment. And they knew what they could do, what they couldn't do. And then when the chase came around, they would, bam, Jimmy Johnson right back up front. So to me, that's what I'm hoping we can do with the uh, 62 South Point Chevy. Hey, Brendan. Uh, RJ Kraft, NASCAR.com. As a Georgetown alum and former hoops player, what did you think of that title game between two schools that have a history with Georgetown? No, nope, I uh, absolutely loved it. Um, it was a, first of all, as a fan, it was a phenomenal game. You know, I, I don't think anybody could say you did not. You know, people love to, love to, you know, hate our sport for bad racing or, you know, not close enough racing, and we've had phenomenal racing this year. But man, what a great game. And in my opinion, sorry to my fellow NASCAR-ites, but I am a much bigger Big East fan than I am North Carolina fan. And so it was awesome to see, you know, the Big East win. And, you know, if you want to talk the, the X's and O's of it, brilliant call by Jay Wright. I mean, what a great coach. What a way to drop a great play. You know, two little shuffle screens, Archie Diacono, a very smart senior. You know, I think we, we talk so much time in basketball about freshmen and sophomore and when they're leaving. And there's a senior, you know, a senior Marcus Page hits the the big three-pointer for North Carolina to tie the game, and then senior Ryan Ar Archie Diacono does a great move to, to get the ball in the right hands you know, and, and draw everybody to him. So, I mean, brilliant ending, amazing deal. Um, you know, I'm waiting for ESPN to run their, uh, you know, the rebirth of the Big East since they want to talk so much about its death. You know, they had so much to do with it, so let's see if they're, they're brave enough to do rebirth of the Big East because uh, I don't see them doing that yet, though. I don't know why. We'll go next to Chris. Chris Knight, catchfence.com. Uh, I know last week, last month in Las Vegas, there was a lot of chatter about you retiring at the end of the season. I was just wondering if that was an early April Fool's joke and <laughs> if you plan to be back next year in extended. Thanks, Chris. You would be the one to ask that, wouldn't you? Um, no, look, every year I almost retire. You know, when I closed my team down in 2007, um, and it, the way it closed down was, was, you know, personally pretty difficult, I never thought I'd race again from there in NASCAR. So I, we've been talking about that for years. What happened was my father some days is, uh, uh, I think the best way I could put it is what my grandfather used to say, that trying to tell my father a secret is like telling the Las Vegas son. You know, it, it's, it's, he likes to talk when he gets around reporters, so he's not real good at the Georgetown version of, you know, not trusting reporters. Not that I don't trust this friendly, beautiful room here. But, uh, you know, he, he just doesn't understand, and so he started joking with a bunch of friends and every year, him and I talk about retirement. Um, every year, I talk about it. He talks about it. One of us does. One of us doesn't. You know, we always are, are saying it and, and, you know, discussing it. But it's always been the same strategy in my eyes. If I can't win races, 
I don't want to be here. And there was a stretch of my career that I didn't win any, you know, where I had some, I was with my own team that was absolutely pitiful. Um, you know, went to a circle bar racing team that was, was my, my hero of Rick Crawford still is going to be one of my heroes for the rest of my life for what he did for me personally. You know, and then we worked hard at a bunch of teams. But now at Richard Childress Racing, we've been up front since 2012. We've won races. As long as I can keep winning races and being up front, and, and if we can make this chase and keep competing for wins and championships, I think we'll stay around as long as I can keep doing it. Go next to Daniel. Uh, Daniel McFadden, NBC Sports. Uh, going back to the, the Dash for Cash, um, mm -hmm. e even in the previous format, did, did the, the rules about how it worked, they, did they always make sense to you? And a uh, second question, with living in Las Vegas, how does that um, affect your like, communication and what mm -hmm. you do with your team on a weekly basis? Uh, first, with the Dash for Cash format the last couple years, yeah, we understood it. It took a while to get it, but in the end it was qualify the race before or the qualifying race, whichever race it was, and be one of the four, and then it was just a regular race with four guys having a race within the race. Um, to me, it's a very similar format of a chase format. You still have 40 cup cars on the racetrack, but only 16, 12, 8, 4, you know, are racing for a certain prize. Same thing with the Dash for Cash. This year, they want us, to me, I think this is NASCAR's volley. You know, they want to see if this will stick. You know, I mean, why not? You've got the Xfinity Series. You've got a sponsor. You've got people that want to see something exciting and maybe try something different because fans are always clamoring about something different. So throw something on a wall and see what sticks. And I think the one thing I do applaud NASCAR with in, in a late version of it is they are very good at if they think they made a bad decision, they will change it. You know, and, and if they think they made a good decision, they will definitely put it up there and say, look, good decision. You know, and I think this is one of those that we'll see. If it's a bad decision, I believe that, that you'll have Steve O'Donnell and, and you know, all the crew out there saying, okay, didn't work, move on. If it did go great, you're going to have Steve O'Donnell standing there with a smile on his face going, cool, you know, maybe we'll try it in the truck series. Maybe we'll try it somewhere else. So I'm excited to try it. I don't know if it's good or bad. I don't care if it's good or bad yet. Let's get there and see what it does. If I win $100,000 at Bristol, I'm going to say I love it. You know, if, if I don't, I'm going to say, eh, let's go to the next week and see how it goes. So I, I think that's a very cool thing. And then as far as living in Vegas, um, I have two children, one that's in school now. And a couple of years ago, I was spending 18 and 20 days apart from my family uh, pretty regularly. And that was just making life very difficult. I'm lucky. I have, I've never felt that you, I should be apart from the team. I've always been a team guy. I played college sports. I live with my team. I'm at the shop every day. I've done that my entire career since I owned my team. Luckily for me at RCR, there are seven guys on my race team that have been with me since 1999, 2000, 2002. They've been with me since I was in my early 20s. And life was getting difficult, and they said, go home. You know, they're the ones that said, get out of here. First of all, Shane said it because I slow production down in the shop when I'm there. But it's, you know, he said, go. And I talked to Richard about it, and he said, look, I'm a 40-year-old man. You know, if I, if I can't handle my responsibilities and be there when I need to be there and do those things, but I'm not Brandon Jones, 19 years old, you know, be there at a certain time. You got to get in this deal. I've been doing this a long time. So it's been great. And actually, it's really what helped us win those couple races at the end of, in the middle of 2014. And what made us run so good last year was my, my home life was much happier. And in doing that, it made racing go better. So my communication is still great with them. Talk to Shane just about every day. Talk to Harley. Talk to the boys. You know, still find out what's going on. Still see him all the time. We still do team dinners. Went to went out went out to Roanoke last night to Reno Reds and had dinner with the team when they landed. I mean, I still do all the same stuff. I'm just not in the shop every day. How often do you go? How, uh, how often do I go back and forth? Yeah. Um, as often as I need. In the summer, we I'll take the kids and we'll move back to the North Carolina house and stay back there all summer and and I'll go to the shop just about every day. But uh, right now, it's only as needed. If you have a short week, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll spend, like, between Daytona and Atlanta, I stayed back there and went to the shop every day. And, and it's just as needed. If Shane tells me I have to be there to fit in a brand-new race car or do something, I'm actually really lucky. My interior guy, Scott Honan, might be one of the best interior guys in the history of this sport. And I've been here 20 years. He is really good at what he does. And I can, he can get a race car now where I can get in it haven't seen the race car, brand new race car, two weeks ago at California. Never saw it, never sat in the seat, brand new seat belts, brand new seat, brand new steering column. We didn't touch one nut, bolt, or seat belt strap. I mean, he is that good at what he does, so I'm lucky. I've got great people, and when you have great people around you, you can get away with, 
with sometimes taking the next step in life. Go next to Chris, close this out. No, <laughs> it's a hard question. I'm throwing the hard questions at you today. I know you were pretty vocal at Kentucky Speedway about not repaving the racetrack <laughs> and they're getting close to re you know, getting that project done. When we go back there here pretty soon, um, what do you hope to see happen with the repavement? Do you hope that there's extra practice time to get used to it? And what kind of racing do you think we'll see? Well, I think historically we've seen some, after repaves, we've seen some very difficult races for the fans. I mean, let's, let's be honest. You know, I mean, the, 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 the tire that Goodyear has to bring is going to have to be super hard. Um, the racetrack is probably going to be super smooth, you know, uh, on a first race. Um, so I'll definitely be able to take a few jabs at Mr. Simmendinger, and, and I always try to take a few jabs at Mr. Smith once in a while, but you take very few at Mr. Smith. And, uh, you know, but I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll throw a few jabs out there, but you know what? Kentucky still has the same weather pattern, still has the same amount of rain, the same amount, you know, it will grow and age faster, I think, than we've seen other tracks. Um, and it will end up, they said they, what was it, they, they, did not change three and four. Three and four stayed the same. One and two went to progressive banking. So I, th I think that's what they said, or vice versa. So, you know, it, it's going to be a fun race. The track, I like the idea of what they're doing. You know, and, and I think that it, uh, in the end, once again, let's, let's let the page be written. But I definitely think we'll see a, a fairly difficult race to pass the first time. It'll be super fast and probably a little difficult to pass for that first year just because that's what happens when you have repaves. But uh, in the end, the track was near... It needed it done. I, I can't say it didn't need it done. We all didn't want it because it put on great races, but it definitely needed it done. Well, Brendan, we really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, good luck this weekend, and uh, good luck in the dash for cash. Thank you, guys.